Now our last lesson, we covered the period in Jacob's life where he fathered the 12 sons who would become the leaders of the 12 tribes of, um, of Israel. Actually, there's a son that's born later, but this is the time where most of those were born. And this he did with his two wives, Rachel and Leah, and their two maids, Zilpah and Billah. We're not going to go through all of that. I, you know, we, we explained the details of that last time. Uh, in our section today, we're going to follow him as he begins to separate himself from his father-in-law, Laban, and begin to journey home. And so that would be in chapter 30. Now, we need to understand that Jacob was in Laban's home because he had run away. And in addition to this, Laban had taken advantage of him because of his weak position. You know, Jacob arrives, he's running away from home you know, because of the trouble with Esau. You know, he makes a deal to have uh, Rachel as wife, uh, but he has nothing to offer. He's, he's living in Laban's house. So by the time we get to chapter 30, he has now worked for Laban for 20 years. And Jacob himself says that in this time he has prospered Laban by his own hard work. So it's time to leave. His obligation is over. He's, he's worked the seven years for, Ra uh, for uh, Leah, then another seven years for, Le uh, for uh, Rachel. And he continues to work uh, even beyond that time. His family is established and the time to return to his land and people are at hand. So we pick up in chapter 30, verse 25. Let's read that. We pick up the story there. It says, Now it came about when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me depart. For you yourself know my service which I have rendered you. But Laban said to him, If now it pleases you, stay with me. I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. He continued, Name your wages, and I will, uh, and I will give it. So Laban acknowledges that Jacob was a profitable worker and that uh, you know, he prospered him and the Lord was with him. Now for this reason, he doesn't want to lose him, so he tries to make a deal. You know, and it's basically, name your price. Name your price. Of course, Jacob had done this before with Rachel and he had been burned, he had been cheated. So now Jacob is uh, you know, a little more uh, uh, circumspect as far as making a deal with uh, Laban. So let's uh, keep reading verse 29. But he said to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your cattle have fared with me, for you had little before I came, and it has increased to a multitude, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turn. But now, where, uh, when shall I provide for my own household um, also? And so it goes on, he says, so he says, uh, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted sheep and every black one among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and, and such shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, is found with, if found with me, will be considered stolen. Laban said, good. Let it be according to your word. So Jacob explains to Laban that the reason his meager flocks have prospered was because the Lord have, has blessed Jacob's work. And so Jacob was about to prove this in the way that he proposed an agreement to Laban. So here's the arrangement, because it gets a little confusing here. Laban's herds were predominantly a single color. White for the sheep, black for the goats, even brown for the, for the cattle. Jacob proposed that as his pay, he would not take any of the existing animals. What he would take would be the spotted or the speckled animals that would be born to the solid colored animals in the future. Okay? He even proposed to section off the existing spotted and speckled animals so they would not breed with the solid colored animals. 
You know, perfect deal for, for Laban. I mean, let's face it, no existing animals to give away, only a minority of future animals, if any, to pay out, and he had little to do with the increase up until this time anyways. He didn't do anything for the increase anyway. It was Jacob's work that had you know, profited the uh, 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 Laban. So uh, we go to 35 and 36. It says, so he removed on that day the striped and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one with white in it and all the black ones among the sheep and gave them into the care of his sons. And he put a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. So Laban didn't trust Jacob, imagine. <laughs> And usually, you know, and this is because he was an untrustworthy person himself, and that's, isn't that human nature? You know? People who are always scared of getting gypped and so on and so forth, being cheated themselves, have a little problem with, with uh, honesty. So what does he do? He separates the flocks and puts three days journey between the, the two flocks to make sure there's no intermingling there, you know, between the spotted and the solid colored animals, just to make sure. So let's keep reading. Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white stripes in them, exposing the white which was in the rods. He set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks in the gutters, even in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, and they mated when they uh, came to drink. So the flocks mated by the rods, and the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban, and he put his own herds apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Moreover, whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place the rods in the side of the flock in the gutters, so that they might mate uh, by the rods. But when the flock was feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. So the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So here in the Bible, the writer describes the methods used by Jacob to increase his own flocks despite the handicap of working with solid colored animals. Remember the deal is, whatever speckled or spotted animals come from the solid colored animals will be mine. Well, you know, the chances were not great. Perfect deal for Laban. Now, scholars don't agree with each other on, on, on some of the significance of this material and the ancient methods described here for animal husbandry. I mean, you know, there's a debate at exactly what's, what's going on here. But basically, Jacob did two things. First of all, he increased the rate at which the animals made it. Okay. The Bible said he put something in their water and had them look at striped wood when they drank. Now we don't, we don't know why, we only know the effect. It produced animals in heat. The idea is that statistically the odds of producing spotted animals from solid was small, so Jacob increased the number of animals produced in total in order to increase the number of spotted produced. So you know, if they only produce 100 animals and only five of those are speckled or spotted, you know, if he can produce 1,000 animals, you know, he increases his share. So the idea is he was working to increase their, their mating. And also when animals uh, were born, he encouraged only the stronger ones to mate, thereby increasing the odds of greater herds and greater numbers of spotted animals. So that's pretty much what you know, we can discern. You know, he, he increased the rate of mating and he uh, encouraged or you know, worked a method where the stronger animals uh, mated. Now some people say that this was unethical, but all Jacob was doing was increasing the rate at which the entire herd and flock was producing so that his own portion would grow faster as well. It wasn't that Laban's portion was growing less. You know, Laban's portion was growing, but so was Jacob's. Now what was out of Jacob's control was the actual number of spotted animals produced from this accelerated breeding. He didn't control that. 
he may have stimulated more breeding, but he couldn't control what kind of animals would be born from that breeding. So in the end, the stronger animals were made to breed using his methods, and the weaker ones were not. And the result was that the stronger animals produced spotted animals. You know, whether they were solid or not, that's what they produced, and Jacob's herds and flocks prospered. In the end, his herds allowed him to purchase other animals and goods, slaves, and so on and so forth, and so he became independently wealthy. So in just a few verses here, the Bible you know, talks about something that's happened over a number of years, okay? This didn't happen in just a, a month. So Jacob had worked hard. He had put his knowledge about raising animals to work, but God provided an increase that was against the odds that Jacob was working with. So it's like that with us too, I think. You know, when we work hard and do our best at what we have and do it with faith, you know, God can bless us even against the odds. So, always a story of faith here. It's always about faith, that's what I say. So let's keep going. You know, most of the rest of Genesis here, as we're going to go through, is a narrative. You know, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. So I'm reading more of it. Why, why should I put it in my own words? You know, uh, the Bible uh, gives the, the perfect words. Uh, I, I'll just try to uh, provide some, uh, some commentary on what we're reading to, to clarify it. So we get to chapter 31. It says, now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father, he has made all of his wealth. Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So by this time, Laban's sons who were seeing their inheritance begin, beginning to shrink, began to speak to their father against Jacob. Again, human nature, isn't it? Human nature, right there. They're seeing you know, what's mine is starting to get less and what's that, that, that you know, stranger, he's not, you know, he's not our brother. So Jacob is told in a dream by God to return home and God promises him that he will protect him. Notice he didn't start to go home until he had the dream still waiting for God to direct him. We won't read verses four to 16. Uh, in this passage, Jacob appeals to his wives to leave with him. And he tells them how Laban has cheated him and gone back on his word. And he describes how God has revealed to him the fact that he would multiply his holdings at the expense of Laban's because of his original promises, so on and so forth because of Laban's dishonesty, you know, this is why he's protecting his own wealth and building up his own wealth. And we see in these verses, both Rachel and Leah, both of them loved Jacob. I mean, they were in competition with each other, but they both loved Jacob. And they realized how badly Laban had treated him and themselves. So the thing about that was happening in Laban's home was that instead of using the money produced by Jacob's free service to build up their dowries for their children's future, Laban had used it to build up his own wealth. So they see his dishonesty and they readily agree to go with Jacob to his own, to his own home. So we pick up the story in verse 17. It says, then Jacob arose and put his children and his wives upon camels and he drove away all his livestock and all his property which he had gathered, his acquired livestock which he had gathered and paid in Aram to go to the land of Canaan uh, to his father Isaac. When Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he was fleeing. So he fled with all that he had and he arose and crossed the Euphrates River and set his face towards the uh, hill country of Gilead. So they depart in haste and in secret because Jacob realized that Laban would not let him go. You know, he's virtually a slave. It seems that Jacob left the way, uh, left the um, way uh, you know, to, to, in the same way that he had arrived. You know, he arrived when he was on the run from Esau, and now he leaves, he's on the run from Laban. You know, some things repeating themselves in his, in his life. 
So Rachel takes the family idols with her in secret. It's kind of an offbeat thing, right? Recent archaeological discoveries suggest that these called teraphemes or images used in divination were also associated with the inheritance and property rights of owners. They, were like de they also served as deeds. Okay? So it, it gives us a little bit of insight, you know, maybe because there's no suggestion that Rachel or Jacob or anyone in their family practice any type of idolatry. And so this, this new information sheds some light on why these things were taken. It could be that Rachel wanted some legitimate confirmation that the property that they were taking was legally theirs by right of inheritance. That would make a little more sense because we never see any accusation of, of her or, or, or Jacob uh, 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 for idolatry. And so in the continuing verses, Laban finds out and he pursues Jacob and just before overtaking him, Laban has a dream where God tells him not to harm Jacob or speak to him in any threatening way. So in this verse, we see that God is fulfilling his promise to care for Jacob, even in ways that Jacob would not even think of. Jacob didn't know that God was even taking care of him by giving Laban that dream. And again, I, I, I can't help but mention how many times God has taken care of us in ways that we don't even consciously uh, realize. Now the next day, again, verses 25, 30, too long, not going to read that. Next day Laban reaches Jacob and he rebukes him for not giving him a chance to make a proper farewell for his you know, daughters and his grandchildren. He also reveals that the reason he doesn't harm them is because of God's warning, which is the truth. But he still manages to kind of say it like a, like a threat. You know, boy, if it wasn't for God telling me not to you know, do something, boy, something else would have happened. So he, he can't help himself. So he also, um, he finally asks for the uh, whereabouts of his idols. So let's read 31, 35. It says, then Jacob replied to Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maids, but he didn't find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle, and she sat on them. And Laban felt through all the tent, but did not find them. She said to her father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of woman is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household idols. So Jacob explains why he left secretly. You know, he, I didn't trust you. I was afraid of you. That's why I left secretly. He also offers to hand over anyone or anything that didn't belong to him. Boy, he gave his word on that. So Rachel hides the, you know, the images there, the idols, by sitting on the uh, saddle, if you wish, the box that it's in, and claiming, of course, she's unable to rise because she's on her, uh, on her periods. Now, it's unusual that this deception is allowed to stand, and because of it, Jacob is spared. Again, it may not be a question of the lesser of two, it may be a question of the lesser of two evils here. You know, on one hand, Rachel is guilty of a lie and she's judged by God. On the other hand, the lie is revealed and Jacob is killed or stripped of his property and sons and Rachel is still judged by God. God will judge Rachel for her actions. But God is protecting that whole group from the fallout from her deception. So this final section describes the heated exchange between Jacob and Laban. Jacob rebukes Laban for his treatment of them. And this includes, again, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, all of this passage, but he rebukes Laban. You know, first of all, his unwarranted pursuit as if Jacob is some sort of thief. He just took what was his. His unfairness in dealing with him in the past. The fact that Jacob served him honestly, never taking any animals, always replacing lost or destroyed animals for his own flocks, losing sleep and going hungry and thirsty in the open in order to do a good job. 
And he finally says, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that God protected and blessed him, Laban would have cheated him out of everything. So Jacob really uh, you know, rebukes him. And so we pick up in verse 43. This is Laban's response. Then Laban replied, and this Laban, he is such a, in, in today's language, you know, we, he's a piece of work, this guy. I mean, he is just amazing what he does. He says, then Laban replied to Jacob, the daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have, uh, whom they have born? So now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. Then Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. So they took stones and made a heap and they ate there by the heap. Now Laban called it uh, Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it uh, Galid. Uh, let's see, the 55. Uh, Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore it was named Galid and Mizpah, for he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. If you mistreat my daughters or if you take wives beside my daughters, although, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Laban said to Jacob, behold this heap and behold the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to you for harm and you will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his kinsmen to the meal and they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. Early in the morning Laban arose and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. So Laban, you know, he makes a weak defense and his defense is all this stuff that you have, it belongs to me anyways. And so, you know, uh, he, he, he wants to always be able to legitimately lay claim to what Jacob has. I mean, he has no proof, he has no, no standing, he simply declares it. It's all my stuff, period. He also makes a hypocritical covenant, a pillar that will be a witness that Jacob will not cross over to harm him, and a witness that God will watch that Jacob will not take other wives or hurt his daughters when in reality, he's the one that's hurt his daughters by spending their inheritance, and he's the one that's che cheated Jacob, and he's the one that's tried to you know, renege on, on their agreement. But he still calls God to be a witness <laughs> for this agreement that uh, Jacob will not harm him in the future. So um, um, it was pretty, pretty uh, hypocritical. But Jacob agrees to the covenant, rather than continue exposing the hypocrisy and the argument. You know, sometimes you just got to cut bait, right? Boom. There's no winning. There's no winning with this person. Have you ever been in an argument or a debate with someone and it's, there's no winning it? You know, so this is what's going on here. In the end, Laban leaves after kissing his children goodbye and the Bible never mentions him again. You know, he's not really a, a great, great character. So we'll stop there in our search for that. I just want to kind of give a couple of lessons, application lessons that we can learn. It's a kind of a simple thing, isn't it? You know, Jacob makes a deal, he builds up his flocks, he decides to leave. They have a little discussion with Laban, a little you know, uh, confrontation, and then they part ways. And you figure, well, it's just a slice of life in Jacob's journey in his return home. But there are so, some really applicable lessons that are taught by this uh, passage. And the first one is, uh, we need to put our whole life into God's hands, all of it. You know, one of the things that Jacob learned in his 20 years with Laban was to trust God with everything, because he had nothing. So he had to trust God with everything. You know. A lot of times you know, we, we, we put our trust in our strength or our health or our youth or our money or our skills you know, and the rest of the stuff that we're not sure about, this is what we're going to trust God with. 
But Jacob was so stripped down to nothing, he arrived to Laban, he had zero, no money, no, he had nothing. Didn't even have a reputation. So he had to, he had to trust God. So in the face of this, Jacob was forced to entrust his whole life, his money, his marriage, his return home to God. And in the end, he even trusted God to provide for the increase of his herd and God rewarded his wholehearted faith with great abundance. And I guess the point I'm trying to get across here is a, a wholehearted faith. A lot of times we have faith and we're wondering, which direction should I be taking spiritually? You know, I have faith, I believe in Jesus. You know, I, I go to church, I think I'm a good person. You know, I'm doing my best. You know. What more, what's the next step? You know, where do I go spiritually? And I think the next step for a lot of us you know, uh, is, is, is asking God to show us how to have a wholehearted faith. You know, the lectureship that, um, you know, at Oklahoma Christian, there was, a, uh, there was a, a speaker there and he said something really interesting. He said, um, he said are you all in? He was talking about Derek Jeter, you know, Derek Jeter, New York Yankees, the shortstop, he's, he's finishing his great career with the New York Yankees. And the, the thing that the sportscasters used to say about Derek Jeter was he was all in, he played ferociously, you know, he'd dive into the fence you know, to catch the ball or he, he'd hustle and you know, he'd, he'd harm himself. You know, he was all in, he was a New York Yankee from beginning to end, you know, he was all in. And he was making this idea, he was making this parallel with us. You know, are we all in, you know, a wholehearted faith? I think there's a good lesson there from Jacob. He was all in. You know? So we need to trust God with our careers and with our vacations and with our health and with our hopes and with our spiritual lives, with every part of our existence. And, and from my own experience, I'm, I'm learning, continue to learn uh, that it's the only way to arrive at peace. It's the only way. You, the only way to, to, you know that peace that surpasses understanding there? It's the only way to get there. It's the only way you can measure that you are having that peace and, and you're experiencing it you know, uh, continually. So we have moments where we go, yeah, I'm feeling good spiritually. This is good, that's good, you know, and I'm saying then it, it, it escapes us. Uh, I think God wants us to have that peace that surpasses understanding, not just when we get to heaven. I think he wants us to live now in that way. So I think there's a, there's a lesson from Jacob. Put your whole life into his hands and there's nothing too small. My wife teaches me that. She prays for parking spots and I would scoff at her and say, come on, stop, stop bothering God. You're making me, you're embarrassing me here. You know? and, and she goes, oh, there's one right there next to the store. You know? now, in Oklahoma City, that's not a big deal for a parking space, you know? but if you've ever gone to Montreal, you know, which is like New York or Chicago, a parking space is a primo thing, you know what I mean? Traffic is just crazy there. And she, she, and she would say, well, that's not too small a thing to pray for. Why shouldn't I ask for that? You know? And I mean, yeah, she's absolutely right. There's nothing too small to, to ask him for. Uh, another lesson. Uh, don't let sin sneak into the camp. You know, Rachel snuck the, she stole it. The Bible says she stole it. It may have been a property right issue and so on and so forth, maybe so, okay, fine, you know. But she stole it. She, God didn't accuse her of idolatry. The Bible accused her of theft. She stole it. She was dishonest. And so, in doing that, she risked destroying the entire camp. Everything could have been destroyed. Laban could have found the excuse to take her back, take back the flock, send uh, you know, Jacob home without his children and so on and so forth. So I think the, you know, the modern application, we need to be careful that we don't allow ourselves or our partners or our children or whoever to bring sin into our camps. And that's sin into our homes, sin into our lives, sin into our churches. And we bring those things in many times through books or ideas, movies, uh, attitudes, pictures, relationships that are against God, that glorify 
you know, evil things. You know, a lot of times a sinful idol in our homes will threaten our stability and prevent us from receiving a blessing. So you know, we need to clean out sinful things, and I think on a regular basis, because they do sneak in somehow. You know, and they sneak into the church as well. And it's okay to point those things out, and it's okay to be serious about uh, be, being uh, aggressive in, 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 in trying to have the church as, as pure and, 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 and as, as clean as it can be uh, before God. We're worshiping Almighty God on Sunday, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, we need to take it seriously. Uh, anyways, I could go off in a different direction, but I'll just I'll leave it at that. I think we, we understand what we're... And then one other lesson, you know, there are all different lessons here about, but they're, I think they all apply. Uh, some people just don't get it, right? Laban observed Jacob for 20 years. He watched this guy, how he worked, how he conducted himself with Rachel, with Leah, and so on and so forth. He learned about his God. He saw his goodness and faith. He observed his good work habits, his honest behavior. He benefited from the blessings that God gave him because of Jacob, 20 years. And in the end, he preferred to maintain his pride and hypocrisy, his greed, his superstition, rather than believe the clear witness of God's presence through Jacob in his life. The thing that it teaches me is it simply comforts me when it comes to my own family or friends that I've had in the past that have observed Lee's and I and our family. I've had people say to us you know, from our family, you know, they, they've watched us and they've watched our children grow and so on and so forth. You know, not a perfect family, obviously. We had all our own issues. You know, but they actually said, I don't know what it is about your family. It's just not like the other families in our larger family. I don't get it. What's so different about you? And Lisa and I would look at each other and go, how can they not see this? They're the ones that get upset with us because we won't, you know, we won't cancel church on Sunday because they want to go to the lake or something and hang out at the lake and they don't get, why? Well, church, you'll go next week, no big deal. You know? They don't, they don't get it, you know, and they're wondering, well, why is it, how come, you know, you, you know, how come our kids you know, are getting divorced and how come there's fighting and this, uh, juniors had a baby out of wedlock you know, and so on and so forth, but we didn't see that happen in your family. Plenty of bad things happen in our family and you guys know it, you know what I'm saying? And, and we'd say to them, well, there's the only difference between your family and our family it's Jesus, it's the only difference. Everything else is the same. We have to work like you have to work. I have my bad habits like you have your bad, you know, everything's the same. The only difference is we have our allegiance to Christ and our life is devoted to the church. That's the only difference. Why are you fighting us on this all the time? Why are you belittling us on this all the time. You want the results that we have, but you refuse to believe the Lord that we serve. You know? And they, it's, it's never clicks. And it's 35 years into this marriage and it still doesn't click. So all I'm saying to this is some people just don't get it. And sometimes you just got to move on. You just have to move on. So I, you know, we invest our time. You know, someone says, why, why won't you go back to Montreal? And we tell them, I'll tell you why, because our family is here. This is our family. This is our family. We, we, we don't have a family. We have relatives, but we don't have this family. This is our family. So this is where we live and this is where, we, we, this is where we're going to die. This is where they're going to bury us. All right, anyways, didn't mean to get too personal, but uh, great, great lessons from Genesis. I love the Old Testament because the, the lessons are so down to earth and human.